Welcome to the American Citizens Abroad podcast. I'm Michelle, and today I'm speaking with Anne Horning Sukup, member of the board of directors of ACA Global Foundation. Welcome, Anne. Thanks for chatting with us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Michelle. You've had a long expat career. Let's start at the beginning. You were an exchange student in South Africa. Was that your first expat experience? Could you tell well, us a bit was, about that? That was definitely the first experience, and it was quite an experience. It was one year in South Africa and in an Afrikaner family, so not English speaking, and it was extraordinary. I mean, it was full apartheid, which was horrible, and it was very, very shocking to see how society was organized and how the treatment of blacks took place, but at the same time, it was on a different continent, in a different language, with a completely different culture, and it was just absolutely fascinating. It turned me on to international experience for the rest of my life. Have you been back to South Africa since? And have you kept contact with friends there? What are your impressions of South Africa today versus when you lived there? I've been back several times. I've taken my husband, my children back. I keep in touch with the family that I lived with for the year. My AFS sister, it was the American Field Service Program, and my AFS sister still lives in South Africa. And it's a very different country. I mean, it's certainly much better than it was under apartheid, but also politically, they're having a very hard time and economically as well. So my heart goes out to South Africa because I really love the country. You majored in French and government studies at Smith College. Did you envision yourself having a career in government? <laughs> no, never. This is going to sound rather silly, but at the time I had no idea what I wanted to major in. And political science or government studies were kind of the catch-all major if you wanted to go into anything. I could have seen myself in journalism or something international or, you know, whatever was going to be international, but certainly not working for the government. That was not part of my plans. It was Smith College that gave you the opportunity for a year abroad in Geneva, Switzerland. What did you do during that year in Switzerland? That was junior year abroad. It was a very well-organized program by Smith College. It was an old program organized right after the Second World War. We were about 30 American students. I think we were all American. As of now, the program has a lot of non-American students in it, but at the time we were all Americans. And we were students at the University of Geneva. So we had very intensive French courses in Paris. Four or five years later, when my French was really quite good, I was horrified when I found my notes from those six weeks that we spent in Paris learning French and my French was absolutely abominable. It was abominable. It was, it was embarrassing to have taken six or eight years of French in the United States and have a level of French that was so bad. So part of the year involved actually learning French, which I hadn't learned up until then. And we traveled. All of us students, we traveled in Europe. I had no intention of living the rest of my life in Europe. And so I felt as though I should see everything because I was only going to be one year in Europe and then I would be back in the States. So I traveled to London, to Holland, to Sweden, to Rome, all around France, all around Switzerland. It was a fantastic year and it was a very, very intense year, but it was a wonderful experience in Europe. I adored it. How did you eventually settle in Switzerland? During that year, there was a young man who was also a student at university and I met him and he happened to be Swiss from Geneva. And several years later, we commuted back and forth first, but several years later, we eventually got married and had children. And I settled here in Switzerland because he was a lawyer or he became a lawyer after his studies. And it wasn't possible for him to be a lawyer in the United States. We never really even considered living in the United States. And I love Geneva. I love Geneva very, very much. And I am a Swiss citizen as well. As soon as I got married at the time, I received Swiss citizenship. So I'm a dual national. I have both passports. Did you have issues adapting to life in Switzerland? Was it easy or difficult being distanced from family? Today we have Zoom, Skype, FaceTime, but I imagine that when you expatriated, connecting was not as easy. Absolutely. This was in the 1970s, and believe me, it was very complicated. Phone calls at the time were, I think, something like $10 a minute. There was no way we could speak. We had no money. So I didn't speak to my family much. I wrote a lot of letters. They wrote back to me. As soon as the internet started in the 90s, we set up a family website. Not even a family website. It was 
my family or something like that. And it was fantastic. That just opened up the world because we posted things about our kids, about our jobs, about our lives. And that changed everything. It was difficult in the beginning. It was difficult not seeing my family. It was difficult not seeing grandparents, especially because they started passing away. And that was that was really rough. I must admit, now there's no separation. I mean, it's just amazing. We call all the time. We communicate all the time. It is very, very easy now to keep in touch. And I adore that. How about raising children distance from extended family and keeping them connected to aunts, uncles, and grandparents? What are the positives and negatives of this? Oh, I'm not sure there are any positives. I mean, raising children in Switzerland was a big positive, but being separated from family was definitely not positive. It was a negative. On the other hand, I mean, I'll just say a a bit about raising them in Switzerland. Switzerland is very international. They both grew up perfectly bilingual in English and French. They had friends from all over the place, even though they were in Swiss schools most of the time. And so it was a big positive for them to see a big world out there that I don't think you necessarily see when you grow up in part of the United States and never travel. We traveled extensively. They've seen the world. That was a very, very big positive. I did make sure that we celebrated American events like Thanksgiving and the 4th of July and Halloween. So we organized things that kept them grounded in their American background. And on the other hand, it was hard not seeing grandparents, aunts, uncles, family, cousins. And what we did was for a long time, we've stopped maybe only in the last two or three years, but we had big family reunions about every two years. And everybody would go to the States. We had one in Switzerland, which was fabulous, absolutely fabulous. We traveled a little bit in the Alps and had a baptism of one of my children. It was really wonderful to have them here. But most of them were in the States and it was big events. I mean, big for us, it was 30, 40, 50 people from all over the United States and us from Switzerland. We actually had part of the South African family who came to one. We had an AFS sister from Argentina in our family, and uh, she came to one in the United States. That was a wonderful way of connecting, and they're still in touch with each other on things like Facebook and LinkedIn. When you started working with Andy Sundberg, one of the founders of ACA at Consultex in 1979, was this at the same time that you got involved with ACA, the organization? Yes, it was probably exactly the same time, maybe one year apart. When I started working with Andy Sundberg, he was such a brilliant person and interested in so many things. He really was a brilliant person. And when he came up with the idea of ACA, which was a follow-up organization from a children's rights organization at the time. ACA was much more inclusive, covering lots and lots of different subjects. And it seemed so natural to set up an organization of American expats. There was very little that existed at the time. As you have just mentioned, it was very difficult to have contacts at the time. It was letters or very expensive phone calls. And ACA, bringing people together in different ways and talking about our situation overseas with people in Washington, just seemed so natural. To me, it was a no-brainer to be there. I believe that we found minutes that show that I was at the very first founding meeting of ACA. And that, to me, I'm very touched by that because I've spent a great deal of time on ACA over the years. I'm very attached to the organization. I admire the organization at the time and today. They've done a fantastic job in raising consciousness, in getting a few laws changed, in communicating to people in the United States the special situation of Americans who live overseas. So yes, it was at that time, really at the very beginning of ACA that I got involved and I was involved up until a couple of years ago. I was very, very deeply involved and loved it. It's a fantastic group of people. So I am a huge admirer and a lifetime member of American Citizens Abroad, that's for sure. What were the first years of ACA like? What issues did the organization tackle? Well, the first years were very rudimentary and amateur. And I don't want to say amateur in a bad sense. You know, there was no word processing. There were no computers. I mean, this was very early years. And we would cut and paste newsletters and distribute it all over Europe. It started very much in Europe and then expanded to different continents. We put together these newsletters of different issues. And the issues were basically how to get children passports. Taxes was very early because double taxation is a big issue. 
There were other issues like adopting children when you're an American overseas, transmitting citizenship to your children, not just getting the passport physically, but transmitting American citizenship, and other issues of Social Security, Medicare or Medicaid, lots and lots of different issues that were very comprehensive, very comprehensive. And ACA, I believe, was one of the very first, I mean, there was a a French organization, but at the time it was very, very French. It was basically Americans living in France. And ACA from the very beginning was international, world, global. And this was something that was new and it was appreciated. And we really started quite strongly. As soon as ACA was created, there were people joining and there were people working for ACA, not only just in Geneva, because it was a Geneva managed organization in the beginning, but all over the world. We had Within a few years, we had country contacts who were ACA members working in different countries all over Europe and in other countries that expanded to Asia, that expanded to Latin America, Africa. And we had country contacts actually in the United States, people who had lived abroad, who felt very strongly about supporting Americans living abroad. And this became a strength of ACA at the time. Now that's a different situation. But that was during the kind of beginning years. I can't remember when it was founded, but we went through various manifestations of ACA. And it was just a very exciting period and very beneficial for Americans living overseas. How did ACA advocate to Congress and keep focused on issues in the early years? I imagine that regular visits to DC were not frequent and you couldn't do virtual meetings. Even phone calls were expensive. How did it all work? We started the door knocks relatively early and we had a couple of very treasured, very valued relationships with members of Congress. So there was a lot of intensive communication with members of Congress who were supporters of Americans living outside of the United States. And then these door knocks, they were not, I don't think it was every year, certainly, but it was a group of 8, 10, 12 people from all over the world, some from the United States, but some from Europe or other continents as much as they could be, traveling to Washington, D.C. and knocking on doors of different congressional people, administration people. And just discussing the issues, educating them on the issues. We had position papers that we worked on that would give the history of the situation, the current situation, how ACA recommended that it could be improved, that it could be changed. It was exciting times. I was working full time and raising a family. And so I never participated in one. I never went to Washington, which I regret now, but I know that it was considered beneficial. We had some concrete effects on members of the administration and on members of Congress. It was the way it could be done at the time. Now, of course, it's done very differently and it's very electronic, but still there's nothing that replaces face-to-face meetings. So I must admit that that was an early activity of ACA. Even now, ACA still does a lot of meetings on the Hill with the administration just to do a face-to-face explanation of what the issues are and how they can be improved by working with American citizens abroad. What is your best memory of the early days of ACA? What were the greatest accomplishments? So many memories. That's a hard one. Memories include really working together as a team to be productive as ACA. I mean, that was, it was a very eclectic group of Americans living in Geneva. And the brainstorming that went on, the ideas, as I say, these newsletters were brilliant at the time. We had someone who would write little cartoons little stories about situations of Americans overseas. It was a very, very exciting time. It really was because we felt as though we were making a change. As I say, we did get a citizenship law changed at the time, and it was hard work. It's very hard changing any laws. It's become easier now that people are better organized. This was all done at a distance. It was all done rudimentary ways of communicating but it worked. And that was really exciting. We had monthly meetings, if not more often. It was just a really heady time. And another time that comes to mind is right when the FATCA law, the FATCA law was passed, which I believe was 2010, but I'm not quite sure now. We got together. We knew when it passed because of contacts on the Hill. We got together probably a month after it was passed, a group of people, a large group of people in Geneva, with political parties. I think we had a representative of Republicans abroad, representative of Democrats abroad, and someone from the Banking Association of Geneva saying, look out, this is a disaster for Americans overseas. 
this is going to make it very hard for Americans overseas to keep bank accounts. And we were absolutely right. We were absolutely right. And people slowly found out about this FATCA law over the next year, but we felt as though we were in the forefront of warning people about how bad this law would be, and it was just as bad as we thought it would be. So that's maybe a negative experience, but positive in the sense that we were following closely, and we understood very, very early on, ACA knew that this would not be good for Americans living abroad, and it wasn't. It's not still to this day. That's one of the problems of living overseas is bank accounts. You eventually ended up working in finance for many years. How did you transition into that field? Oh, as I said, I had a hard time finding a major in college. So I worked in temporary jobs in Geneva for a while. And I had worked in finance in Geneva in an international sense because I couldn't get a job without getting married to my husband because I needed a passport to get a job. As soon as I got a job, I started doing temporary jobs. And some of these temporary jobs ended up being in finance companies. And I was just fascinated. The whole world of Swiss finance, today it's one of the tops in the world. Even at the time, it had a fantastic reputation, high quality people, very international investments. And this, within a couple of years of temporary work, I knew that this was what I wanted to do. And someone contacted me and said, you know, you don't have concrete physical experience in this besides temporary jobs, but would you like to come? And we've found out about you from someone. And I went out to this job and they said, why should we hire you actually? Because you don't really have any financial experience. But part of the job was secretarial at the time. I mean, that's, you know, it was kind of what women did in the beginning was you started as a bit of a secretary or an assistant to someone and then you worked your way up. And they said, why should we hire you? You don't have any Swiss experience. You don't have any international experience. And you've never worked in a bank. You've never actually worked at a bank. And I said, basically, you should hire me because I'm a really good secretary. So I got the job because I really was a good secretary. But then within a year, I was working on accounts. I had my own clients. I worked my way up very quickly, but I was bilingual at the time, which was a big advantage for them. I had a very easy way of communicating with clients. They liked me. And the bank was very high quality in investments. So that was a way of getting into finance. After that, I left the bank after 16 years, and then I set up my own company, And then I had that for 11 years, and then I went into another bigger financial company. So I've had a varied experience in finance, but it's been a very fascinating career, very fulfilling, very interesting. Finance touches every bit of life, basically, and working with clients. I mean, I loved math, and I loved clients. I love people. So you can tell because I talk a lot. Finance for me, being a portfolio manager, was exactly what I wanted to do. And it gave me enough time. I was independent enough so that I put in a lot of hours for American citizens abroad. That was a big appeal as well, because we had a lot of meetings and did a lot of work for ACA. I'm guessing that working in that field, you were pretty close to some of the issues that the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, also known as FATCA, presented to U.S. citizens trying to invest and maintain foreign financial accounts. What has it been like for clients and people you know? FATCA is basically, you can tell from the name, the very tricky, gimmicky name is FATCA, which means FATCA. And it was aimed at Americans in the United States who had a bank account overseas that they were not declaring to the IRS. That was the aim of the FATCA law. No one who worked on this bill understood that Americans live overseas and they do their home banking overseas. I have a bank account in the United States, but I don't use it for anything besides American bills. What I use is my Swiss bank account where my salary goes. And banks were required all over the world to declare bank accounts of Americans to the United States. But to us, it's just a regular declared account, which allows us to live a normal life overseas because banks didn't want to do this extensive reporting. Banks started closing the accounts life accounts, normal salary accounts, they started closing accounts of Americans overseas just to make their life simpler. So American citizens abroad went berserk and we've worked extensively on the FATCA law trying to explain that this is targeting people who basically some people have lost their mortgages on houses owned overseas. They've lost normal bank accounts. My bank that I worked for for 16 years sent me a very nice letter and said, we know you understand this, but we have to close your account. We're not going to keep American accounts because we don't want to do the reporting. 
So FACA is a major problem for Americans living overseas. They were never the target of FACA. The target was tax sheets. And Americans living overseas are not tax sheets. I know people personally who have been affected by this. I have been affected. It's a big problem for people living overseas. We're very restricted now on opening new bank accounts. I desperately hang on to my sole Swiss bank account that I have left because I know that I'm not going to be able to open a new one if I lose this one, not with a U.S. passport. You've done a lot of work with women's organizations over time, notably with the Career Women's Forum. And you recently did an interview on Swiss TV regarding women on boards. Can you tell us more about this? I am a firm feminist. My mother was a feminist. She went to a women's college, Smith College, as I did which is a very feminist college. And then I got into a man's world, which is the world of finance. And whether it's in the United States or abroad, it's very much a man's world. I must say that genetically and educationally and professionally, I'm a feminist. So I've always been active in women's groups. The Career Women's Forum is a wonderful group of professional women in Geneva. I was president for a couple of years. I've also been active with the American International Women's Club in Geneva, which is much more of an activity-based organization, but also some absolutely fantastic women. And my interview on Swiss TV about women on boards, it's born of long-standing frustration with the fact that women are so little represented on boards. It's getting slightly better, but I have been working on this issue just as I've been working on American citizens abroad and American issues. I've been working on this for 40 years, and it's very frustrating that it's taking this long to move and to evolve, that there are still boards where there are no women, or there are lots of boards where there's one woman. And when a woman speaks up when she's alone on a board, you get the feeling that you, as a woman, you're representing all women on this planet. You know, they, they turn to you and say, so what do women think about this? Well, you know, do all men represent all men on the planet? No. I mean, every woman is an individual with her own life experience and her own professional experience. And we need more than one woman on boards. I mean, it just seems so self-evident. We need parity. We need 40 to 60 percent of both sexes. And we need variety. We need different origins of people, different races, different backgrounds, different everything. With that, that strengthens the corporate world. It strengthens any organization to have diversity on the board. So this is also an issue that I feel very strongly about. We're not there yet. We're absolutely not there yet. Just as with ACA, there's much to do. There is still much to do with women on boards. And I'm still giving speeches and mentioning it and making comments to organizations or corporations that are not representative. And I basically tell them that they can't do this anymore. It's over. So get with it, get with the page and make some changes to make your board diverse which is profitable for your company or your organization. I'm not saying this for some kind of a in the clouds dream world. This is beneficial to organizations and corporations. And I think that's been proven over and over again. And that's what I use as an argument. So it's also a big issue of mine. So it sounds like you think that in Europe and Switzerland that they're behind the curve for women on boards and more women breaking the glass ceiling. What does the future look like for women in senior management roles in Europe and Switzerland? I can't say it's really behind the curve. Switzerland is not certainly ahead of the curve, but lots of different countries. Germany has passed laws. The UK has a kind of, I don't think it's a law, but it certainly is a strong recommendation that boards be minimum 40% of one sex or the other. The United States is woefully behind, woefully behind. So I can't say that the United States is a model for women on boards or for women breaking the glass ceiling. I mean, women CEOs are still far and few behind, whatever that expression is. You can tell I'm losing my English. And it's just that this is, as I say, it's beneficial. I think it's moving just in the last few years. It's finally becoming a big issue, including with investors. And I knew that when when investors, when shareholders started putting pressure, then it would change. But even in the last couple of years, there's been a letter sent by some kind of an ethical investment organization, I can't remember the name, but they sent a letter to several hundred firms, the small and medium firms on the NASDAQ, and a lot of the answers came back, we don't find qualified women. And that's no longer an acceptable excuse because the women are out there. And if they can't find qualified women, then they're not looking in the right place. 
So the people who did this questionnaire were actually horrified by the answers. And I think that there's still a great effort to do, a great effort. I loved when I was in finance, which I'm not anymore. I've retired from finance, but I loved welcoming people to my office. They would do a PowerPoint presentation and I would flip through to the end to see what their board and their executive management was like, especially if it was all men in both places, board and executive management. Then at the end, I would close the PowerPoint and push it back across the table to them and say, you know, it's a really interesting company you have. And, you know, I'm sure you're doing very good things, but there's no way I can invest in your company. There's no way I can buy shares in your company. And their face, I did this probably 15 or 20 times, their face was just stricken. You know, what did they say in the PowerPoint that would cause me to say, I'm not going to invest in any way for any of my clients in your company? And then when I explained it, all of them kind of stuttered and said, oh, we're working on it. Oh, we're working. We're going to find women. We're going to make a more diverse board and more diverse management. But, you know, I never checked back with them because I frankly wasn't interested in companies that had that attitude in the first place. So I think that in the last few years, we've finally started to see many more women on boards, many more women in management. It's still very slow. The Fortune 500 is way behind. Switzerland is behind. All of Europe is behind. And it has to change. And it's just barely starting to change. So I think there's hope. I'm not at all pessimistic about it. I think this is taking place right now. So I'm very optimistic about women on boards and women in management. You've gone from finance to transportation as a career focus. You're now the president of the Administrative Council of TPG, the Public Transport System in Geneva, and are a chair of the board of TPG. Can you speak about how you transitioned to this position and what are you currently working on? Actually, those two titles are the same. It's president in French and it's chair of the board in English. So I only have one role at TPG, TPG, and it's a huge role because it's a big public company owned by the canton of Geneva. This was a fluke of getting into this position. The minister of transportation in Geneva was looking for someone. He wanted diversity and he didn't want a politician. And so he interviewed 20 or 30 or 40 people, including a lot of women, a lot of people who are not from political positions. This is the first time that the chair of the board has been someone who's not a, a politician or from a political background. And we got along very well. And I gave my vision for TBG and he hired me as chair of the board. So this was a fluke, but I am having an absolute ball. It's fascinating. The whole world of mobility in today's world, even more so with COVID, is absolutely fascinating. We have to make some very big changes. This is almost an issue like women on board. We have to change. We can't do cars anymore. We're at the end of the car period, the car century, basically. Getting the job was a fluke, but now that I'm in this job, it's been over four years, what we're currently working on is very diverse because what we have to do first is get the basic business right. This is buses and trams, and we have to get that right. That has to be efficient, has to be clean, has to be sterilized in today's world, and it has to allow people to get to where they want to go. So luckily, the canton is very supportive of public transport. We're not only just in the canton of Geneva. We have lines now that go across the border and that go into France. And that's a big deal because it's uh, a lot of the people who work in Geneva live in France because it's slightly cheaper than Geneva. This is already an international company. It's not just Geneva. But some of the new things are obvious things like autonomous vehicles, modern ticketing, because why should we just sell tickets for buses and trams? Why don't we sell a ticket that includes a rental car if you need it on the weekend or the shared bicycle plans? Or taxis, if you need a taxi once a month, why not have an hour of taxi or half an hour of taxi on your ticket? So that's also some of the thing that's going on. Another thing is virtual reality, where you're working on virtual reality for training. That's exploded during COVID because people couldn't be in the same office together for sanitary reasons. So this has been a huge and very quick development of online training. And also we're working on virtual reality on training drivers. So it's a virtual reality with the helmet and with the actual controls of a tram in your hand and a screen in your helmet. And it feels as though you're actually driving a tram. So it means that people can train extensively before they take a great big heavy tram out onto the rails. 
So we're working on a lot of different innovation and it's very exciting. It's very exciting to be in this subject right now when it's changing so fast. It sounds like Geneva is at the forefront of public transportation. It already has the renowned world-class nationwide train system and an excellent city public transport systems. Why does public transport work so well in Switzerland and not as well in other major European cities? Part of it is public support. It costs money to run a good public transport system. In the United States, basically, and in a lot of European cities, the investments for the last century have been in cars. The car infrastructure is expensive and very inefficient, but that's where all the investments went. Building new bridges, building highways, expanding highways, which is a disaster. Every time you expand a highway, you create more traffic. It's called induced demand, and it's absolutely proven in city after city. What's been fascinating, and this is why I say that COVID is changing things, and we have to change. We've been talking about it for years, but now we have to. The rapidity of changing a car-centric system in Europe is absolutely fantastic. And it's been very, very fast. Everyone talks about Holland. Everyone rides bicycles in Holland. But in Holland, everyone drove cars until the 1970s. 60s and 70s, Holland looked exactly like New York City with gridlock everywhere and cars everywhere and bicycles weaving between cars and being knocked over constantly because, you know, putting a bicycle in the same place as a big two-ton car is not a good idea, really not a good idea. Holland changed. Holland changed because of popular pressure. It was people pressure that made Holland change. It wasn't that the politicians said, oh, we think that maybe in 30 or 40 years, people are going to say, you know, it would be better if we had mobility that was not polluting and that was not creating traffic jams. We should go for durable mobility. No, at the time, they wanted to avoid killing people. And it was women in Holland who said, you know what? Some of our kids are dying on the roads. We don't want cars on the roads. We want our kids to be able to take their bicycle to school and we want them to be safe. And this argument, this convincing conviction of Holland in the 1960s and 70s is now taking place very quickly in London, in Paris, in Rome, and in Geneva. I mean, Geneva politicians took advantage of the COVID lockdown to install new bicycle lanes. We need pressure from the public, but we also need support from politicians. So... Why does public transport work so well? It's well supported. 40%, nearly half of the population of Geneva, of the city of Geneva, has no car. That's the same percentage as in New York City. In New York City, 40 or 50% of the population has no car. Why are we building roads for cars? This is something which is ongoing. You can tell I'm very passionate about this. It's not just congestion and pollution, it's also people dying. In the United States, it's 30 to 40,000 people die in traffic accidents every year. And this is like planes falling out of the sky every day and not doing anything about it. So I'm very passionate about the role for public transport in public health, in walking more, bicycling more, in congestion, pollution, but also in saving people's lives. We all know that quality public transport systems in the U.S. are spotty. Is there a city in the U.S. that is doing it well? And what can the U.S. learn from the Swiss in this regard? Uh, that's an excellent question. Every city is making an effort, more or less, but the effort is so small. Just before the lockdown, I'd say in October of last year, New York City closed a street, a major cross-city artery. They closed to car traffic, and they made it only buses, buses and bikes, I think. And, of course, the predictions were dire. The predictions were that's a major cross-city artery. There's no way you can shove cars off of that street and not have major gridlock in all the streets around. But they announced it. They publicized this. They explained it for months. And when it happened, the traffic evaporated. There was no congestion in neighboring streets. So this was so clear a result. And the bus, the bus, the speed of the bus went up like, I don't know, 25, 30%. And people were thrilled because they could go from one side, from one river to the other river in a fraction of the time that they were doing before. So this was a timid effort of New York to change things. 
but very timid. And when I say timid, I mean, there were cities that are going backwards now. They closed streets to car traffic because there was so little car traffic and they opened it to bicycles because you could maintain social distance on a bicycle. And now they're putting them back to cars. So there's no city that comes to mind that I would say really has it right. Cities are trying. Chicago is trying to put in better bike lanes. A bike lane is not a streak or a stripe of paint on a road. That's not a bike lane. That's like a death lane. A bike lane has to be separate from car traffic or cars have to be actively discouraged from being on the same road. So all of this is very complex, but I would say that there's no city that comes to mind, perhaps some California cities that are making an effort, but they're also very criticized for the timidity of these efforts. There's no city that's really, really getting that well. And I think the U.S. have to, in city after city, urban planning has involved keeping cars moving. And there has to be a shift in diversity. This is another diversity issue. Engineers, traffic engineers and urban designers in the States are white men. That's been for 100 years. And they build cars. They build car lanes. And so if we need anything to create quality public transport in the U.S., I think we need diversity. We need more women. We need more people of color. We need all kinds of people from different backgrounds. We need people who ride bicycles every so often or all the time. We need walkers. We need young people because a lot of young people don't get driver's licenses now. So you can tell by how long I'm talking about this, but it's a multi-answer there's no one answer, but there is certainly an issue with diversity. The group think has to be changed, and I think that's going to come. There are lots of exciting voices in urban planning now in the United States, and they're talking to each other, and they're convincing local people to stand up for their rights. When I say stand up for the rights, it's the right not to be knocked over by a car. Let's call it that. The right to not be killed by a car, because that's a major issue in the States, and no one talks about it. Getting back to ACA... You sit on the board of directors of ACA Global Foundation, the research and educational arm of ACA Inc. What do you think of the work ACA is doing at the moment to advocate for Americans living overseas? ACA is also multi-pronged in their communication, and I greatly appreciate it. You know, they're on Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook and email communications, and they're constantly communicating. They're constantly telling what they're working on. And part of this is, you know, these same issues keep coming up. As I've said in the beginning of ACA, ACA has always been a, an organization that embraces a broad variety of issues. And now I see articles on living abroad, retiring abroad, just moving abroad. How does this help? We weren't doing much of that in the beginning. We were very legal issues. And now I think it's much more of how can you move overseas? How can you be overseas? How do you live overseas? How do you raise children overseas? And I think that's really good. When you say the ACA Global Foundation is research and educational, that's definitely research and educational. And there's so much more research on Americans living overseas that could be done that we've talked about for years. But I think finally, maybe ACA is, is able to do it now with more formality and more serious work. So it's exciting to see it evolve. You've seen ACA evolve quite a bit over its 40 plus year history. What do you see for the future for ACA and ACAGF? Oh, I think it has a, a strong future ahead of it. It was much needed when it was founded. It's been much needed over these years. It's brought together a, an amazing group of people. When I talk about diversity, I mean, that's really ACA. It's a lot of very diverse people who live all around the world, who feel very strongly about retaining their American roots, their American culture, their American background, but also living in international areas or non-international. I know of several Americans living in Iceland. I mean, Iceland is not a highly international culture, but they're very integrated and they're very active in bringing American culture to a country like Iceland or parts of Africa or parts of Asia. This is exciting work. I think ACA will have a role for many years to come. That's what I would really sum that up with for many years to come. On a personal note, I've heard you are a bit of an amateur genealogist. Without divulging too many family secrets, could you tell us a bit about your family history project? Oh, this is my, my dark hole. When I go into my genealogy research, I fall into the dark hole and it takes me a while to come out of it, but it's fascinating. I was never very interested in history. 
which I found very dry and very boring. And now I'm absolutely fascinated by history. I have one branch of the family, which is East Coast American aristocracy, Mayflower, et cetera. And the other side is Chicago, Czech origin, people coming to the United States for a better life and to take advantage of opportunities. And this has been, for me, a lifetime of comparing these two parts of the family and going back on each part. I wrote a book, actually, about the family. It's about 150 pages. It's only published for the family, but I gave it to a few archives of towns that I mentioned in the book. And it's really, how did these Czechs come to the United States? What did they do after they got there? What was the family culture of the Czech side? So now that I've done the Czech side, now I probably have to do a Mayflower book as well. So I have much to do, and I think my retirement will be extremely full and fulfilling. Finally, the big question, what do you think the future will be like for U.S. citizens who want to expatriate and experience either a year or life overseas? I think the future for U.S. citizens who want to leave the United States, whether it's temporarily or permanently, I think their future will be rich. And that has nothing to do with money. It is so fascinating to live in a foreign culture. I feel very American in Switzerland, even though my French is absolutely fluent, but I feel very American in Switzerland, and I feel that that's a plus. And I feel very Swiss when I go back to the United States. I don't understand why we can't do better in certain fields of the United States. So you get a viewpoint living outside of the United States that it's impossible to have living inside the United States. It is definitely a wealth of culture, of experience, of discovery, of open mindedness. And this is the experience of living overseas is incomparable. There's a columnist, I think his name is Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times, who at one point recommended that every college students spend one year outside of the United States. And I think that's brilliant. Maybe not even one year, maybe three months, but at least to live outside of the United States in any country, in any culture, that's a huge plus for any American. And I think we should encourage it and we should do it more. Thank you, Anne, for joining us today. The American Citizens Abroad podcast is a monthly podcast that is published the second Tuesday of each month. It is edited and produced by me, Michelle, and is a product of American Citizens Abroad. You can find us on Twitter at ACA underscore podcast, on Facebook at American Citizens Abroad podcast, or you can email us at podcast at americansabroad.org. Remember, give us a good rating on Apple Podcasts so other Americans living abroad can find us. 